Uh, we are going to continue our study of Mark, though, Mark chapter 6. If you want to turn there, our passage will be Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 13. This is Jesus sending out the 12. You can also find this in Matthew 10 and Luke 9. And we'll touch on those a little bit, but mostly we'll be in, Math, in Mark 6, since that's the passage that we're studying in the book we're studying. Mark chapter 6, or yeah, Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. Speaking of Jesus, and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake the dust that is on your feet, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Let's pray. Lord, your word is truth. It's eternal. It's your revelation to us. It's not everything but it's everything we need to know for life and godliness. And we praise you for it. And we ask you today to speak it to our hearts, to minister to us in your power and in your authority. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to move this up so it's not popping. Will that fix it? Easier said than done. All right, there we go. All right, so... You know how we do it here at Bethel. We preach our way through the text of the Bible, and I like that. I really do it. It, it forces us to stay in the text. It prohibits us from you know, just picking out our own particular um, topics that we want to talk about, and it prohibits us from avoiding difficult passages and socially difficult passages. It's what we call expository preaching. Pick a book and preach your way through it. And it requires us to make the main point of our message grounded in the main point of the passage that we're studying. And I like that a lot. But this way of preaching doesn't come without its potential dangers. And one of those dangers shows up in our passage this morning. It is possible to take a passage like what we have here this morning and pull it out and try to make it stand on its own, disconnected from context. And our passage lends itself to that. I mean, you could read this passage, and I could preach from it a missionary message saying that since Jesus sent the disciples out and he told them, don't take anything with you, no bread, no bag, no money, no extra clothes, then that's the way missions should be done. That missionaries should go out with nothing, and when they get to the foreign country they're assigned to, expect the people there to take care of them. Because that's what Jesus told the apostles here in this passage. Well, of course, that would be a ridiculous conclusion to draw from this passage, right? Why? Why is that so ridiculous? Didn't Jesus tell his disciples to go out empty-handed? No bread, no bag, no money? He did. We just read it. So why do I say it's dumb to make this a universal conclusion for all missionaries for all time? Context. Always. We always, always allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. In the context of the surrounding passages, in the context of the entire book in which we find that passage, in the context of all of the New Testament, in the context of all of Scripture, in a historical context, in a, in a cultural context. Context is king when it comes to biblical interpretation. Because if we don't, we end up making some pretty crazy conclusions. And it happens. For instance, did you hear what the Pope said last week about the Lord's Prayer? Have you been keeping up with that? He changed it. I'll let that sink in for a second here. The Pope, a man, changed the Lord's Prayer. Now, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ here. It was his prayer. And the, the Pope saw fit to change 
God's words, Jesus' prayer, to fit his interpretation from a human context, from his context. See, here's the problem. When you decide not to let Scripture interpret Scripture, then who's interpreting Scripture? Man is human, right? So here, the Pope, a mere human being, (laughs) sets himself, his reason, his reasoning, up above God, and he attempts to change, to modify what God actually said. It's crazy. Well, since our passage context is really important to our passage this morning, I want to look at what the Pope actually said and how it applies, because I think this is really important. In Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells the apostles, (coughs) excuse me, the disciples, how they should pray. And in the midst of that prayer, in Matthew 5, verse 13, Jesus said, and lead us not into into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Well, Pope Francis, just last week, made it official that God's word must be changed. And he changed that phrase, lead us not into temptation, to do not let us fall into temptation. Seems like a minor change, doesn't it? Well, he changed it basically because, well, I'll I'll just read it. Here's why he changed it. Quote, this is the words of Pope Francis, I am the one who falls. It is not God pushing me into temptation to then see how I've fallen. A father doesn't do that. A father helps you get up immediately. It is Satan who leads us into temptation. That's his department. So the Pope looked at that passage in Matthew 5 and using human wisdom and modern context of human fatherhood and basically said, in his own human view, one, fatherhood is um, how fathers ought to act. I'm going to determine that. And based on my view of God, I'm going to change this. I'm going to change what Jesus said. Now, obviously, you and I know he can't change the word of God. The word of God is eternal. But in his context, and according to his parishioners, he wants them to understand that the Bible got it wrong. Now, the fact of the matter is, there really is no theological problem here with this passage. God does not tempt us. James says that. makes it very clear. Scripture makes it very clear that God does not tempt us. God doesn't put evil desires in our hearts to try to get us to sin. But he does bring us into the presence of trials and tests and temptations. The Lord Jesus Christ himself was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Yes, God puts us into temptation. We, you and I cannot walk through this world. I can't, we can't go for a minute without the risk of temptation. Temptation is everywhere all around us. Now, man plans his way, God directs his steps. So God is directing us into temptation. You, can't, you, you cannot avoid being tempted. What Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, what he wants us to pray is, Basically, Father, help us that we would not enter into the temptations when they come. It is not a sin to be tempted, Mr. Pope. But it is a sin to enter into the temptations when they come. The evil is there. The temptation is there. The prayer is, Father, please don't let it pull me in. Deliver me from this evil that is before me. And he promises that help. You remember 1 Corinthians 10, 13? Boy, I hope you know it. If you don't, please go learn it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That's God's promise. That's God's word. That is the greater context of what Jesus was saying in Matthew 5, 13. That if you and I will look to him in a time of temptation, he will provide the way out. But the Pope, misreading the Lord's Prayer, says that a good father would never lead his children into temptation. So the Bible must be wrong. In his inflated view of himself and his own reason and his, perhaps his position, the Pope compares man's social context to God and decides that God is wrong and his words need to be changed. Well, as John Piper said this week about this issue, This type of Bible modification completely undermines the authority of Scripture. 
so that man becomes the judge of what God should be like and what God should say. Please understand, here's what the Pope said. The Pope says, a father doesn't lead his children into temptation. A father helps you get up immediately. It is Satan who leads us into temptation. That's his department. Guys, he got it all backwards. He turned the whole thing on its head. You and I don't decide what God should be like based on our understanding of human fatherhood. No, we understand human fatherhood, fathers, based on God's self-revelation in the Holy Scriptures. Pope Francis completely flipped it around. He looked at human behavior, and he judged God, and he decided God's, word were out of, were, God's words were out of line and needed to be changed. This is like people who say the dumbest thing a human being can possibly say when they say, well, I can't believe in a God who, dot, 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 fill in the blank. I can't believe in a God who would send Joshua into the promised land to kill all those people. I can't believe in a God who would send people to eternal damnation. So you're saying that because you don't like those things, you think that God shouldn't do them. So you're going to use yourself, your context, your human understanding, your human sensibilities as the standard by which you're going to judge whether God's being appropriate or not. Wow. Be careful with that. See, God does things with his son that no human father would ever be allowed. You remember, right? God sent his son as a sacrifice for others. What human father is allowed to sacrifice his son for others? Well, God's not a man, and he doesn't act like a man. And so when we judge God according to human standards, we're way out of line. If, if Pope Francis is bothered by this, all he needs to do is look at the broader context of Scripture. And you see that God does not act like a man. What human father would send his children out into the desert with nothing? God's not a man. And when we come to the pages of this book, this eternal book, we come to the pages of this book to find the knowledge of God, not to try to tame God and to make him into someone that we're comfortable with. That's idolatry. And that's what the Pope is, is guilty of in this case. It's idolatry. The Bible is the revelation of God's truth. It's his word. We never get to come to this word and try to manipulate it to get it to say something that we're comfortable with. That's why I'm spending so much time on this this morning. Well, one, because the Pope said it, and I think we needed to address it right after he said it. But two, because the passage that we're dealing with this morning has the same kind of potential. We could pull this out of, out of context and, and make something out of it that it's not. Jesus says in this passage, Mark chapter 6, don't take anything with you. He says the same thing in Luke 9. He says the same thing in Matthew 10 is that Jesus' instruction for missions for all time? No. All you have to do is look at, at Luke chapter 22. If you, if you want to turn there, in Luke chapter 22, we're at the Last Supper. Jesus is giving his last instructions to his apostles before he sends them out to go plant the church. And we discover by reading Luke 22 that Mark 6 is descriptive, not prescriptive. In Mark 6, Jesus is describing his instructions to the apostles on that day for that trip, but it's not prescriptive for all missionaries for all time. Look at Luke 22. I'll begin in verse 35. Remember, this is the Last Supper. And Jesus said to them, When I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, Nothing. He said to them, now, but now let, he, let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, we have two swords. And he said, it's enough. That's the context. 
again, Mark 6 is descriptive, not prescriptive. So let's go ahead and look at Mark 6. You might ask yourself, well, then what can we learn about Mark 6? If that was just for those disciples on that day, what can we learn about it? Well, there's plenty. So let's begin in verse 6. Just looking back to what we saw last week. In verse 6, Jesus left Nazareth because of their unbelief, and he goes about in all the villages around to teach. Now, for a little bit of context, since context is so important, remember that Jesus here is in the process of forming disciples. He is making these men into the disciples that he wants to be. Yes, Jesus goes out and he preaches in all these places, but he knows that he is not the one who's going to plant the church in those places. He's not going to plant the church in Israel or throughout the known world. That job was going to fall to the disciples. And as we've seen in Mark all along, Jesus has these guys in a training program. Jesus didn't come into the world to plant the church. Jesus came into the world to die for the sins of the world. Now he's planning on these very ordinary, very common witnesses to spread the news and to plant the church worldwide. So for two two years now, these disciples have been following Jesus around. They're listening to his sermons. They're listening to his teachings. And now there's little over a year left in their time with with Jesus. And so Jesus calls the 12 to lay it all out on the line. They knew he had called them to be disciples. They knew he had called them to be followers, but they had no idea what that was actually going to look like. They had no idea that he was leaving and that they were going to be left with this job in their hands and on their shoulders. Up to this point, they've been watching Jesus do all the work. And they're still thinking in the back of their minds, he's going to set up this great government and they're going to get to serve in the government as important people. That's what they thought that following Jesus was going to be. So what they've been doing, basically, is they follow Jesus around is just a little bit of crowd control. They hang off to the side and kind of take care of the crowd and let Jesus teach and let Jesus heal. And Jesus says, no, now it's time for you guys to go out alone. Well, two by two. So in verse 7, it says, And he called the twelve, and he began to send them out two by two, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits. So Jesus says, I want you to go out there, and you're going to go out there without me, and you're going to do kingdom work with kingdom responsibility on your shoulders. So now instead of people crowding around Jesus to see him, and they can hang out to the edge of the crowd and just observe, now they're going to be the person who's at the center of the crowd, the one who people are pressing in to see. And he wanted them to be ready because he knew he was leaving, and he was going to leave it all in their hands. And he wanted to provide for them some supervised training. And that's exactly what we have here in Mark 6. This is a great example for parents, especially you parents who still have children in your home. What a huge mistake we make when we shelter our kids all the while they're under our roof, living in our home, hoping that one day, miraculously, they're going to leave and be able to go out in the world and spread their wings and soar like eagles without any kind of intentional training on your, ha- on your behalf. And what about the people that you and I disciple? Are you discipling someone? Does disciple making in our minds, in our North American context, just mean meeting with somebody for coffee once a week and, and talking about the Bible? Well, if we use Jesus' model, at some point it must include having the people we're discipling carry kingdom responsibility and do kingdom work. And that has to be intentional. Jesus was sending a very clear message to the 12 here. If you want to be my disciple, then be prepared to be sent out. To be sent out with some heavy kingdom responsibility on your shoulders. But don't be afraid. I'm going to give you everything that you need to get the job done. In verse 7, it says, he gave them authority. And if you look in, in, in Matthew 10, he gave them authority and he gave them power to do what he was sending them out to do. He gave them a job and then he gave them the resources. And the more impossible the job, the more supernatural the resources that he gave them. Now please notice the verb that he uses here in Matthew, in Mark chapter 6 and verse 7. What's the verb? What did Jesus do? He gave them power and authority over demons and over sickness, as we see in verse 13, if you look down in verse 13. It was a gift. These guys didn't work for it. They didn't earn it. 
It wasn't something they had to conjure up by digging deep down inside themselves to conjure up some kind of spirituality. One minute, one minute they didn't have it, and the next minute they had it. It wasn't something they learned in a seminar on demonic forces or in a book about spiritual warfare. They didn't achieve this by fasting or prayer or training or by deepening their own spirituality. No, it was imparted to them as a gift. It's so important for us today. I mean, how many false teachers are out there trying to entice people by saying to them, you know, if you do it just right, if you hold your mouth just right, God will give you, you know, all the power. He'll, he'll let you work miracles the way I'm working miracles. You know, if you just do the right things, say the right things, if you fast enough or pray enough, God will give you this. It's a lie. That's the same lie that Paul was dealing with in Corinthians. If you remember our study of 1 Corinthians, those were people who were trying to be super spiritual and they were putting too much emphasis on the spiritual gifts. And that's what we see people doing today. There is only one spiritual force in the kingdom of God. And you're not it. His name is Jesus Christ, and you can't be him. In Isaiah 46, verse 9, he says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. See, the Lord Jesus gifts these 12 apostles here in, in, in Mark chapter 6, not because they were spiritual or because they were strong, but because they were weak and because they needed God's strength. They needed God's power and they needed God's authority because they were being sent out to confront the prince of the power of the air. They were simply given these because Jesus had chosen these guys he, and he called them and he sent them. He calls us the, the 12 together here in verse seven and he sends them out and they were willing to go. It's that simple. That's all they had to do, just be willing to go. And they were bequeathed this power, this authority to go out and do these things with simple childlike faith. That's all it took. So if we're still tempted to think that these guys, these 12 apostles, were a spiritual notch above normal human beings, that they were somehow super spiritual, please remember that one of the guys, one of the 12 that went out and worked miracles on Jesus' behalf here in Mark chapter 6 was a thief, a liar by the name of Judas Iscariot. Judas also went out and performed miracles in the name of Jesus. Doesn't make him super spiritual. He was just given a gift. See, the gifts here have very little to do with the 12 who were sent out. The gifts were intended for the people out there. The gifts that Jesus imparted to them, in this instance, were intended for the people of Israel. In Matthew chapter 10, we're told that this sending, Jesus gave them the instruction only to go to the people of Israel, not to the villages of the Gentiles, not in this one, not this trip. So they were gifted by Jesus with power and with authority to go out and bless people because Jesus loved these people. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 9, as he looked at the nation of Israel, they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he had compassion on them. What a poignant word picture. Here is the picture of, a, of an abandoned flock of sheep. They're scared. They're scattered. They're frantically trying to avoid wild beasts. And there's no shepherd to take care of them. No one to watch over them by day. No one to lead them into the safety of the sheepfold at night. They were all alone and Jesus felt for them. He hurt for them. And so he reached out to them. One of the ways he reached out to them was to call these 12 in Mark 6 and send them out to go take care of his sheep. Please understand, Jesus still does this. When Jesus' heart goes out to one of his sheep who's suffering, please understand and don't be surprised that it's very likely God will lay his hand on your shoulder to go minister to that sheep on his behalf with his authority and his power. Jesus says, in effect, I'm calling you out of the flock. Uh, no longer are you just going to be one of my sheep. Now you're going to be a caretaker in the flock. You're going to be a shepherd. I'm going to make you a, a minister to go out and take care of my sheep. Are you willing? That's the question I'd like to ask you this morning. Are you willing? 
when you see the needs of the people around you, maybe in this room, in this body, or in the body at large, or maybe the needs of somebody who's not saved yet, are you willing for Christ to send you to that person in his name, in his authority, with his power? I know some people are a little confused about Bethel Bible Fellowship because we don't have a paid pastor. You know, visitors come in here and they're like, who's the pastor? We're like, well, we got five or six, I can't remember now. We got a group of men, right? And they're like, yeah, but who's in charge? We don't have a paid pastor. We don't have a lead pastor. And I understand that. And I think those of us who've been here a while, every one of us probably at one time or other wished we had a lead pastor. Somebody, some guy in charge, large and in charge we could look to and cast all our cares upon. And, and we just don't have that. Now you might ask, why don't we have a paid pastor here at Bethel? The answer is pretty simple. We just haven't called one. We could if we wanted to. We're not against that. There is pretty good New Testament scriptural evidence that most of the New Testament churches had bivocational pastors like we do. They had pastors who had other jobs and then ministered to the flock. But the really cool thing about the way that we do leadership here at Bethel Bible Fellowship, at least in my mind, is that Since we have lay pastors, the job of shepherding, of ministering, of taking care of the sheep largely falls on the shoulders of the flock. See, the elders here at Bethel are all just normal guys with normal jobs in the community or retired from normal jobs in the community. Yes, we are here as shepherds, as caretakers in the flock, but we simply don't have enough time as bivocational pastors to pour that much time into everybody's needs here. And so others have to step up and be caretakers and shepherds and ministers and organizers and leaders. Well, the good part about that is then the body gets to work as a body and take care of itself, not just looking to one person that we pay to be a hired gun to minister. Now all of us have to step up and minister. When somebody's in the hospital, if Joel doesn't come visit you, You can't say, well, Bethel never came and visited. I've heard that before. Somebody's sick in the hospital and 15 people from Bethel go visit them, but because Joel or Jim or Matt or Jeff or somebody else didn't show up, they don't feel like they've been visited. Well, at Bethel, that's not the way we work. See, here at Bethel, what it means is we get to work as a body, and that means you you can't. You can't just be a pew sitter, a chair sitter, in, in our case. Jesus calls each one of us to go out and help those who are helpless and harassed with his power in his name. God calls all of us to be ministers. See, ministry means looking for opportunities to make an impact in someone's life through the power of Jesus Christ. That's ministry. When Jesus sent the 12 out here in Mark 6, he gave them two jobs. So in Matthew chapter 10, he breaks those down. He says in Matthew 10, He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So he sent them out to minister uh, to their spiritual needs, and he sent them out to minister to their physical needs. And he gave them resources for both. And he tells them here in Mark 6, verse 8, Take nothing for your journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics or coats. No bag, no bread, no money. No extra clothes. Jesus wanted them to be entirely dependent upon him for everything. Jesus wanted to teach them here at the very very first trip utter dependence on God. He was sending them out completely empty-handed and yet with every provision that they would need for success. God's authority and God's power. Now, please remember, this is a training trip. This is like a test flight. He's just taking these guys out to help them grow in their understanding of what ministry was going to be like. Because Jesus knew that these guys, they were going to be itinerant preachers for the rest of their life, living this way for the rest of their lives. And Jesus wanted to be sure that they were ready for it and they understood, they had a taste of it. And we don't have to guess why Jesus had these guys travel so light. Matthew 10, he says it. Jesus spells it out in verse 10 of Matthew 10. He says, don't take anything with you, for the worker is worthy of his keep. Jesus says, I'm sending you out with nothing, but I'm going to take care of your needs. 
not with manna from heaven, not with water from a rock, but with the people, through the people that you go to minister to. I'm going to use their hospitality to take care of you. And here again, we have one of those principles of the body, that the goers, the ministers, are not to lord it over the receivers, those who are receiving the ministry. But there's mutual dependency. He goes on in Mark 6, in verse 10, he said, and he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony against them. So he says, when you get to, get to a certain town, go into a house and stay there. Now, that doesn't mean stay indoors and don't ever go outside, just hide in those walls. That's not at all what he's saying here. He says, if a town will welcome you and a family in that town welcomes you, stay with that family. Build a relationship with them. But if they won't welcome you, then just shake off the dust from your, sh- from your feet. Now, that's strange to us. Jews in the day would completely understand this. Jewish people, when they left Israel and went to voyage maybe into Samaria or one of the pagan Gentile lands, when they traveled about in those lands and came back to the Holy Land, when they got back to the border with Israel, before they actually stepped into Israel, they would take off their sandals and shake out the dust and then symbolically shake the dust out of every hem in their garments before they walked in back into the Holy Land. It was a Jewish way, a visible way of expressing scorn toward the Gentile nations. And Jesus tells his disciples here to do the exact same thing with any town that rejects the message of Jesus Christ. Not as an act of vindictiveness, but as a prophetic testimony against that town. If you're going to reject the message, then you are rejecting the one who sent the message, and that's Messiah. So he says in verse 10, whenever you're in a house, stay there. Don't depart from there. What he means by that is, when you go into a house, if there's a poor family who's willing to host you and and show you hospitality, stay with that family. And as long as you're in that town, stay there with that family. Don't try to upgrade. In the ancient Near East, it was common practice for traveling speakers, traveling preachers, to be hosted uh, within a, a village by a family. But it was also common for the rabbis who were traveling to look for the best place to stay. So if they enter town and they're they're staying with a a local poor family who's showing them hospitality, and they happen to be well-received in that town so other people like what they're saying, it wasn't uncommon for rich people in town to offer them, why don't you come over here? Stop staying with the poor family. Come live with us. We've got a pool. We've got better meat. Just come stay with us. And they would look for an upgrade. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't bounce around. When you get into town, if there's a family willing to host you, stay with that family until you leave. Now, Jesus, in fact, knows these guys aren't going to be well received wherever they go. If the Jews were rejecting Messiah when he was there standing in front of them working miracles, Jesus knew that his own disciples were going to be rejected as well. For whatever reason, God has determined that the gospel message will always only spread through opposition and persecution and skepticism and unbelief. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10. Actually, go ahead and turn there. I'm going to read a good section of this. Matthew chapter 10. Mark uses seven verses to cover this event. Luke only uses six verses in Luke chapter 9. Matthew gives us all kinds of detail about Jesus sending out the 12. The, all of chapter 10 is about this event, 42 verses. So I'm not going to read it all. I, I strongly encourage you to go read it. But I'm going to start in verse 11, and we'll go through verse 22. So Jesus also said this in that event that's recorded in, in Mark 6, Matthew just gives us more detail. Verse 11, And whatever town or village you enter, find out who's worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or that town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Why? Because they're rejecting Messiah. Verse 16, 
Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in the synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. Now, that didn't actually happen on this trip. But Jesus knew it was going to happen to them in the future. Every single one of these guys was going to face that kind of opposition. Verse 19, when they deliver you over, don't be anxious about how you're to speak or what you're to say. What you're to say will be given to you by the Spirit in that hour. For it is not you who speak the Spirit of the Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver over brother to death, and his father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. You will be hated by everyone on account of me. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. See, it's clear by these instructions that the facing of opposition would be applicable to anybody who goes out and preaches the word of God. They will hate you. They will all hate you on account of me. So that is applicable for every mission, for every missionary, and for every Christian throughout all time. So for all the Christians out there who think that the sign of a good Christian is that you're loved by everyone, I mean, isn't that one of the messages we hear from the emergent church, that we have to make ourselves acceptable and lovable to everyone in order to get them into the church, in order to accept our message? You know, in our day of tolerance we'll read verse 22 again and you will be hated by everyone on account of me now I'm not saying that we should go out and make everyone hate us by being a bunch of jerks love should be our banner when we go out we should go out and give an answer with gentleness and respect but make no mistake even when you go and really share the gospel from a pure heart of love they're going to reject you, and they're going to reject it, and they're going to hate us. See, the, the gospel message begins with telling people that they're sinners and they need a Savior. That's never going to be a popular message in our hypersensitive, pseudo-tolerant culture that we live in. And to try to water down the message of the cross simply to make it more palatable to our culture means that we will become guilty of changing the words of God, like the Pope has done this week. We've already talked about that. So what is the message that you and I carry when we go out? Well, according to Mark 6, look at verse 12. It says, they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. That's the exact same message that John the Baptist had back in Mark chapter 1, verse 4, where it said that John proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's the exact same message that we see in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, that Jesus had. When Jesus says that the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. That's exactly the same message that Peter has in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when he says, repent and be baptized to every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the, for the forgiveness of sins. That's the exact same message that Paul had in Acts chapter 26 when he was preaching to the Gentiles and he told them to repent and turn to God. See, for all of those guys that I just mentioned, the preaching of the gospel message began with a message of sin and repentance. That is the root of the gospel message. The gospel is not about you having a better life. It's about life, period. It's about a reprieve from the death penalty. That's the gospel message. The gospel message begins with a conviction of sin before a holy and righteous God who holds us accountable for our sin. We stand guilty before him. The gospel is first and most foundationally a proclamation that every single human being on earth is a sinner. And that salvation can only happen in the heart of someone, a sinner, who realizes that God is just and that God will destroy the sinner. So you and I, when we go out and proclaim the good news of the cross, 
we are charged with the responsibility of bringing that person to the point of repentance. Repentance simply means a change of mind, literally in the Greek. The Greek word metanoia means a change of mind. To change your mind about your sin, to change your mind about Jesus Christ. At one point in our lives, we loved our sin. We lived for it, even though we were in bondage to it. But repentance means that we come to the realization that my sin is ugly, it's destructive, it's abhorrent. Repentance means that I go from cherishing my sin to being repulsed by it. Repentance is basically to agree with God that my sin is disgusting. Repentance is revulsion to sin. Where in one instant, we are in love with our sin, and then because of the work of the Spirit of God in our life and the gift of repentance, we realize, one, that my sin is despicable, and two, that it warrants eternity in hell. And that realization causes me in my desperation to cry out to God for mercy. See, repentance is not something that we do in addition to faith. Repentance is part of faith. Repentance is the God-given ability to see things as God does. That's faith. It's also repentance. To see sin for what it truly is and to see Jesus Christ for who he truly is. Uh -oh. To see Jesus as he truly is and then to cry out to God for mercy. Some people say, well, you can't preach repentance because that diminishes grace. No, no it doesn't. No, repentance is that gut level realization that I need grace. I, by my sin, have gotten myself into such a bind that I need extravagant grace in order to bail me out. And only God can do that for me. Only he has an answer for my sin. And there is nothing I can do to get my sin off of my back. I have to cry out to him, and he's willing to do that. That's what repentance is. It means to turn from my sin to the God, the only one who has an answer for my sin. So here in Mark chapter 6, Jesus sends the 12 out on their own for the first time. And in verse 13 it says, And they cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who were sick and healed them. These blue-collar guys who have no formal training go out and they change people's lives by the power of God. They bring people to repentance, they cast demons out, and they heal people. Twelve ordinary guys given the authority of heaven and they got to see the power of God work. They went out and they proclaimed the kingdom of God. That is to say, they went out and proclaimed to people, the king is here. That guy who's wandering around doing miracles, that's Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He's here. He's come to save the world. And they got to see that. It wasn't reserved just for them. Because then if we fast forward to Matthew chapter 28, in verse 19, Jesus says, as he's leaving earth, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. You go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. It's, it's on us for, for all time. Jesus gives the responsibility of reaching the world and planning the church to you and I. But he gives us everything we need. He gives us his authority and he gives us his power. Now I'm sure that the idea of sharing our faith with other people makes a bunch of us uneasy. Christians are scared to death about sharing their faith. And I understand it. We live in a nation that is increasingly hostile to Christianity. We live in a nation where people have bought into the myth that it is impolite to talk about religion, especially if you're going to talk to the other person about their sin. Heaven forbid. I mean, to do that would definitely be seen as intolerant and, and pushy. So it's very common today. You, you go to try to share your faith with someone, and, and what are they likely to say? Oh, my religion is very, very private to me. I don't talk about it. And so what do we do? Well, in false love, we back off and we shut up, not just with that person, but with everyone, because we're afraid of stepping on anyone's toes and making anyone uncomfortable by telling them about Jesus. So we as a Christian church nationally have just shut our mouths because we don't want to be seen as intolerant. Well, I called it false love. Why do I call it false love? 
Because basically what I'm saying is, when I don't share the gospel with someone, I'm willing to let that person go to eternal damnation because I'm uncomfortable with, idea, with the idea of, of offending them. I'm basically admitting that I fear that person more than I fear God. And I'm basically admitting that I don't really love that person. That I'm willing to let them go to an eternity of damnation rather than be in some kind of conflict with me. I like my lack of conflict more than I love them. And so I just shut up and don't tell anybody about it. Let me be very clear here. Our relationship with Jesus Christ was never meant to be a private matter. You and I are commanded to give a testimony of what God has done in our lives. You don't have to be a theologian to do that. Just tell people what Jesus has done for you, like the demoniac that we saw a couple of weeks ago. Now, that doesn't mean going out and fighting with people. If you go and you share this message with somebody and they reject you and they reject the message, you don't have to stand there and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and try to convince them and grab them by the ears and come up with apologetics to try to convince them. No. Now, you have permission right here in this text to shake off the dust from your feet and move on. Maybe you sow to seed that God will germinate with somebody else's witness some other time. You and I are not responsible for the results, but we are responsible to be out there sowing the seed and cast it. We're not responsible for the soil that it falls on. There's four different kinds of soil it can fall on. But we are responsible to be faithful in the transmission of the gospel message. Now, Jesus does make it very clear, just so you're, you're aware, that those who decide to go ahead and do that, to obey that, it's going to be costly. He says that they're going to hate you for it. If, if, if you're addicted to being well-liked and having a good reputation, then don't get involved in gospel pro proclamation because you will make enemies, and that's not comfortable. But oh, the rewards of knowing that you're pleasing God and that you're being used by God to advance the kingdom. It's worth it. In fact, before we finish here, I want to turn over to verse 30. You're in Mark 6. Turn over to Mark 6, verse 30. It says, the disciples returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. There's a sense of excitement there. Jesus sent them out, and they got to do what Jesus said, and people were healed, and people came to faith, and people were delivered of their demons. And they came back to Jesus all excited. Now, please understand, when these guys were sent out, you know they were scared out of their minds. They had no idea this was coming. They thought they'd just get to follow Jesus around. He was going to be prime minister or president or king or whatever, and they are just following him around and, and be his, his secondhand men. And all of a sudden, they're on the spot to do it. And then God gives them the power and the authority to do these miracles, and they do them, and they come back, and they, and they tell Jesus all about it. And, you know, 12 guys were just gushing with all their missionary stories they wanted to tell him about all the people they healed and all the things that they saw and all the things that God used them to do. I love that. And that's my prayer for you this week, that the word of God would burn in your heart this week, that you would, like these disciples, be encouraged to draw on the authority and the power of God that is yours to bless the people around you in your life with the message and the love of the cross. Let's pray. Actually, you know what? Before we pray, sorry, Jim, I have a question for you. We just saw in verses 7 through 13 that Jesus sent out the 12, and then in verse 30, the 12 come back and give a report. Well, what happened between verses 13 and verse 30? Yeah, he tells this story about John the Baptist's death. Why? Now, don't answer. That's my question for you this week. As you prepare your heart and your mind for the message next week that Joel's going to bring, I want you thinking about why did Mark see fit to insert the story of John the Baptist's martyrdom right here in the middle of the, the telling of the sending out of the twelve? Now remember, as you consider this, that Mark is in the process of making disciples too. Mark didn't record this just to give us a history of the things that happened. Mark was also building disciples for the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to make your word burn in our hearts so we can't contain it. And that you would give us eyes of faith to see people as you see them, as lost, as hopeless, as harassed, as people without a shepherd. 
and to see you as the one true shepherd who can really and truly meet every need that they have. And then make us willing to impart that to folks. Give us the words at the right time, in the right way. And we'll trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.